square term here. So when a squared is term out, get yn squared. The cross term is given by this. And this term here is given by that. And this is the additional term here. Uh, so, yeah, I want to write this in the form this. So, what does that mean? Well, what is the linear term first? This is the easiest one to do. So, B is the linear term from here. So, we've already got the linear term because if I just look at the prefactor of W trans, um, the linear combinat contribution from here is given by one of the sigma squared sum over n of minus uh, two y n that we transpose phi n, where phi n is just the phi evaluated at the x point. So if I have a, um, you know, I want to say minus uh, term here. Um, yeah, there's a half missing somewhere. But anyway, so B is just given by this, plus or minus a half. The slightly more tricky term is to get A, and I, I kind of assume that you'd be happy with uh, the algebra, but maybe, maybe it's true that there's not, there is a kind of point that is not so maybe immediately obvious. So let's look at, let's look at the, the quadratic contribution of this expression. So clearly there's a quadratic, quadratic term here and a quadratic term here. So this is the quadratic term from the prior. And this is the quadratic term from this point here. Okay. So it's maybe not obvious how to rewrite this, how to disentangle the the sum of the n in it here into a quadratic expression in W. So this is the you, you, you use an algebraic trick to do this. Um, so the idea is you can I don't know if you can see this, but you can. The square term you can write is W transpose phi n times by itself W transpose <coughs> phi n. So I can, because A transpose B is the same as B transpose A, it's the same thing, I can say switch around one of these expressions as well. It doesn't matter which one I do. Let's say I switch around this one. So it's W transposed by N by N transposed times by W. So I've got one over sigma squared sum over N. <coughs> so the, the advantage of this is that I can now bring this summation inside the N. So I'm going to end up with W transpose sigma to the minus 1 W plus uh, W transpose 1 over sigma squared sum over n of phi n phi n transpose times by W. And then this, of course, is just W transposed sigma to the minus 1 plus 1 over sigma squared sum over n by n by n transposed times by w. So this is a matrix a. So this this is the key key step here. The two you rewrite that as this and then you you switch around one of these scalar products. Get an outer product expression for here. So if you don't know this trick, you'd, yeah, you'd, you'd be you just you wouldn't be able to write this as a simple uh, matrix. Ah, I was surprised you all thought it was obvious. Maybe it is. I mean, it, 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 it is obvious when you know how to do it, so I just thought maybe you knew how to do it. But, uh, do let me know because um, I always assume you know all this stuff. Okay, so.
so we're going to try to finish off today. We want to, want to talk about something a little bit uh, fairly simple. So you'll see some of the, much of this material you've already seen before. So it's a time series model, as you know, the Hedemark model. This is the same notation as we, we saw before. And of course, you know, there are many occasions, and you've already seen some things we can do with the Hedemark model. It's a very powerful model. And you know that you know, it's, it's kind of, this is the Markov model, and this is the Markov chain. Um, so we've got a Markov chain. That's just by counting. Now the HMM has got this this structure as we've you know we've already discussed. But what we've uh, been doing is you know there are many different inference mechanisms we can we can apply to this. So if you say I know what these visible variables are, how do I infer something about the hidden variables? Well, it's a singly a singly connected distribution. So you know there are a whole range of Algorithms we could apply there. There's the junction tree algorithm is easy, or the the um, you know the max sum algorithm. All, all of these algorithms are applicable. In practice, though, once you've been doing that, we never do that. Actually, so I've been slightly misleading you. I mean, there are definitely valid things to do, but um, you'll never find. In, in a real application, a real implementation, people using those algorithms um, for various reasons, either particularly that they are not the numerically most stable algorithm. So if you've got a small t problem like we've been doing in the exams and the assignments, it's fine. You, know, you, you can get away with, with, with those uh, simple implementations. But in some you know, cases, we have really big Problems in the sense that maybe this H has got uh, 10,000 states in it. And maybe the length of the time series is 2 billion. What that means is that you know, when you do these propagations of the, the max product or the max sum algorithm, any numerical errors that you get on these recursive updates are going to kind of start accumulating. And before long, you'll, you'll either run out of memory. Uh, sorry, we run out of uh, bits to accurately represent the problem, or things will just a numerically kind of, you know, you get round of errors which will screw up the whole thing. It's just useless. So, making uh, numerically stable implementations of HMMs is, uh, is really important. But there is one way to do it, which is just to, instead of, you could use the, the, the sum product algorithm, but instead of working on the, the tables directly, you work on the log tables. So if you're interested, you can look at the BRML uh, software, and it does it for you. There's a, there's, a, there's a class there, the log array class, which actually rather than using an array potential, it uses a log array potential. And that will pretty much solve the problem. Um, but there are other ways to do it, and uh, I'm going to tell you about them now. OK, so just the sort of notation thing again. So we have. Just to remind you, we've got a transition matrix for the hidden variables, and we've got an emission matrix for the visible variables or distribution. And we want to do things like filtering, so the inference of HT given all the observations up to time T, uh, prediction, you know, maybe something what was happening for the future T given maybe some observations in the past, smoothing, you know, what is, uh, say, something about the distribution HT given say the past and the future. So looking back, you know, what was the most likely say distribution of safety or something about the super subject of the type of the T. The likelihood itself, that's interesting to compute because maybe if you want to learn parameters, you want to compute that. And the turby or the turby alignment or the work than that. Uh, 
is just the most likely trajectory through the hemispheres, given all the observations. OK, so what we're going to do here is forget about the, um, the sum probability of the junction tree and just do it directly. Okay, let's imagine, you know, those guys who did this first in the 1960s, you know, they, they didn't, they never heard of the sum probability for the junction tree. They just did it you know, directly. Of course, it's equivalent mathematically, these things are all the same. But this is just another represent a derivation of the same uh, the same algorithm if you like but it's more direct and it's more um, numerically useful in some sense okay so how does this work so one way to derive filtering is as follows so let's let's first of all consider the joint distribution between ht and b1 to t and then i'm just going to write that as the marginal of this distribution here so this is just all of the v1 to t is v1 to t minus 1 and v2. And I'm just going to mark in, introduce this ht minus 1 and then sum over that. So this, this is a totally valid uh, thing. It's uh, just the marginal uh, joint distribution. Now I'm going to rewrite this as p of vt given all of that times by the probability of all of that. That's just base rule. So I'm going to write that first term as P of Vt, given everything on the left. So that'll be Ht, Ht minus 1, and V1 to T minus 1, times by the probability of all of this. Ht, Ht minus 1, and V1 T minus 1. OK, so Vt. <coughs> Given ht, ht minus 1, and all the previous b's. Well, if you're given ht, this is everything you need to know to specify vt. So it's conditionally independent of ht minus 1 and all the previous observations for the, for the hmm. So this means this term here is just, they are they can be dropped. And I can write this term here as P of ht given ht minus 1 and v1 to t minus 1, <coughs> ht minus 1 and v1 to t minus 1. Okay, and similarly, if I, um, you know, ht given ht minus 1, and v1 to t minus 1, I don't know vt here. Well, it's conditionally, if I know ht minus 1, it's conditionally independent of all the previous observations. It's the only thing which is directly you know, deconnected to ht. So this means that this is a, can, be, can be neglected just for the h1. So those are, those are those two steps. Here. So we can simplify that just to write P of Vt given Ht, the emission distribution, the transition distribution. And this term is interesting here because this actually, this is this sort of, you know, if I call this thing the joint filter distribution, it's actually the joint filter distribution at time t, and this is the joint filter distribution at time t minus 1, just a t index shifter. So if I define, say, alpha of Ht to be a vector. Which has got components of this like this. Remember, Vt is also that's given. You know what those Vt states are. So I get this recursion that alpha Ht is, I can bring that to P, P, T, given Ht outside, and the sum of Ht minus 1 is transition times by the previous alpha. So this is, this is called the classical uh, predictor corrector method from the 1960s. So your Essentially, taking your previous filter distribution, you're, you're you're pushing it through the transition, so you're going to the next time step. So that's why it's called a predictor, and then you're correcting it by the actual observation that you observe at time t t. So it's kind of a correction of your prediction. That's what they they call it that. Okay. And uh, your initial <coughs> point, your initialization of this is just p of h1 comma v1, which is 
proportional to be V1 given PV1 given H1 K2. So that's your initialization. Then you just run this filtering recursion through time. So this is, you know, you 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 would derive you would derive this yourself, but it's, it's kind of clear that because we know that we can you know do this tail biting procedures, you know, for the single connector structures, this is another implementation of that. So it's, uh, it's exactly the same. So if you were to try to push the summation of HT through the products, you'd essentially end up with this. Um, it's just a kind of a, a neat derivation of the, the same thing. So in, in practice, this is what people use uh, in natural implementations of HMS for doing filtering. Okay. <coughs> now another thing to, to say though is that if these these alphas in principle are uh, you know very their, their, their probabilities and they're going to be small, right? So we're going to get so these alphas are they are joint terms of HT and one of two. So typically with that what this means is this alpha is going to be of the order of something like so let's say the, let's say the, these H's are these V's are binary variables. This alpha will be the, of the order of two to the power minus t. Because that's going to be the likelihood of, of observing the B length and T length B sequence. Okay, so in other words, it's going to be very, very small this alpha. So this is mathematically correct, but it's going to be hard to implement numerically because things are so small that we're going to run out of bits to, to get this implemented in the computer. It's not going to work. So one thing we could do is we can work, we can work with the logs of these alphas, just try to do that thing. And um, I probably won't explain that. So if you come to the applied machine learning course, I'll explain that. Term. But uh, another thing we could do is we could say, well, you know, if the only thing I care about in the end, let's say you only care about filtering in the sense that you just want to know what is QHT given B1 to T. So that's proportional to, to, to this term. So that's alpha HT. So in other words, your your filter distribution is proportional to alpha HT. So of course, what that means is that we could we could rescale alpha by any constant we wish, and it doesn't change anything. If you know, we could re we could rescale it at the end, right, as well. So in other words, what I could do is I could say I could start say with this one here, this alpha here. So that's some vector, and I could just normalize it say, if I want to, to make it a, a distribution. Right. So I could just re you know, normalize all the components of that to sum them up and divide each element by the sum. And I get some normalized alpha, which would be uh, a distribution. In that case, it would be P of H1 given V1. And then I could, say, take that normalized alpha, put it into here, run this thing through, and I get a new alpha, which won't be normal. But then I could normalize this new alpha to get something which sums up to one. So in other words, I take that, that alpha and then I sum up these components, uh, divide each element of alpha by that sum, to get a normalized vector. And I can keep doing this. So each time I just renormalize the sub the alpha that I get. So each alpha will then sum to one. Okay. And so what will happen there is that that's going to be numerically less problematic in the sense that the alphas are going to be, you know, they're all going to be living in this sort of, you know, bounded sphere, basically. So that, that's good. Um, you're not going to run out of bits, typically, to represent that. And because the only thing, if I, you know, if I just want uh, this, then actually those alphas that I get from the normalization will, in fact, be this. They are the sort of distribution. See what I mean? No, kind of. No, it's not clear. Okay. Um, let's say we have two states for H. Okay. So let's say that you you run this thing, and you find out that alpha times the 
one is 0.7 and 0.8. We're two states of H. H is one or two. You normalize this thing to go to 0.7 over uh, 1.5, 0.8 <coughs> over 1.5. That gives you now a normalized alpha one. This thing is equal to, actually, this is the probability of H1, this is state 1, given V1. And this is the probability that H1 is in state 2, given V1. So the two, two elements. Now what you do is you say, well, So alpha at time step two, is vector at time step two, is equal to um, so it's P of uh, V two uh, given H I times by the sum of the J P H I given H equals J alpha from time step number one of uh, J. This is the recursion. This is this recursion is, is true for the for the correct alpha, right? But I could multiply alpha by any number I want, say z, just some scalar normalization time. And so if I say alpha two is it was a proportional to any 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 rescaled version of alpha one. So I could say, I could normalize alpha 1, call it alpha 1 hat. So alpha 1 is a normalized version of, of the alpha 1. So it's certainly true that alpha 2 is proportional to this thing. So I do this thing, and I get an alpha two vector, which will be, say, you know, again, it might be something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. I can then renormalize that to get alpha two. It's 0 0.3 over 0 0.7, 0 0.4 over 0.7, and that's equal to actually the probability of H two. Yeah. Why don't you just normalize it at the end? I do. Uh, you mean at the end of the whole calculation? Yeah. Because I could do that. That's that's also fine. Okay. But it doesn't help you because. What will happen is that the if these numbers are really small, let's say this number here is I don't know, um, say not point uh, so if, if this here is say not point one, okay? And let's say this is it this could be epsilon. Okay, some some number. And let's say each of these is order um, um, one over one over H. This number here, let's say it's order um, one over B. So H 
H is a number of hidden states, these are the physical states. This means that this alpha HT is going to be roughly of the order, um, you know, 1 over, so we're going to sum H of these, so that H will cancel, roughly speaking. So we're going to get epsilon over V. So if we, if we then go to the next step, it's going to keep going down. So this thing now will get replaced by epsilon over the squared, and it's going to it's going to exponentially get smaller. So we uh, we're in trouble. We get numerical underflow. So we, by um, renormalizing at each step, we don't have the problem, but we do lose the overall normalization term. We can actually compensate for it, but uh, I don't want to discuss that here. But, um, but so, yeah, if, if the only thing we care about is, is knowing what these alphas are up to some normalization term, then we can be free to renormalize at any stage. Of the and that's what, I, what I'm doing here. So if you if you want to know what is the likelihood, another way to do that is uh, this is a true expression. Okay, this is the normal marginal of this distribution here, which is actually this is alpha at ht. It's just the sum over the last uh, time point of your alpha at ht. But this assumes though that I've not done renormalization. If you've done renormalization, then you can't use this, this expression anymore. So you have to do something else. To now keep track of those lost normalization terms and, you know, and re, you know, restore them somewhere so they can then use this sort of expression correctly. Okay, so that approach there was called um, sequential. It's a sequential approach. Uh, so I want to explain just briefly two other classical approaches for doing smoothing. Again, you, you, you can do uh, junction tree or whatever you wish to do. Uh, but again, people don't tend to do that. So here's uh, what people typically derive. So they say, okay, we want to know now, say, HT, you know, V1 to big T, the whole sequence. And you can write that in this way. So we, we decompose V1 to T as V1 to small t, and V T plus 1 to big T. So what we can write then is, I could write this as P of HT, comma uh, B one two T, given B T plus one. Uh, two, two. So I write the first line of that as P of B T plus one to T given ht and v1 to t times by p of ht and v1 to t. Okay. That seems to be all perfectly valid. Um, you want to know what is the What is the probability of observing the t plus 1 to the end of the sequence given ht and v1 to t? Well, if you know ht, it becomes condition dependent of past observations. So actually, that you can follow. So this term here is this is filtering. And we just need to figure out this this term here. So this is a kind of a future future term. So the question is you know how to get this and what we call this term is beta. So um, 
this is beta for the, the t minus one term. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a, a sum of ht, this joint description. I'm not going to go through the derivation, but you can go through it yourselves, and you'll find some things cancel by the usual condition dependencies, and just a couple lines, you immediately end up with this nice expression, which is the this is the beta at time t minus 1, and this is beta here at time t. So you can end up with this beta recursion. Beta is some simple recursion here. And this, this recursion goes backwards in time, well, forwards. And uh, initialization is that beta at n time is just well, it's a unit vector for the time minus 1. So this is very, another very simple backwards recursion. And then the posterior distribution for the smooth <coughs> thing is you just take the product of the alpha and the beta message, the forwards and the backwards parts, and you just normalize to make that distribution. This is called parallel, parallel smoothing because you can run the alpha forwards pro um, propagation, and simultaneously you can run the beta uh, backwards uh, message. They don't communicate, these two messages, the alpha message and the beta message, they're totally independent. So you can run them in parallel, um, one on one processor with another processor, and you just combine the, uh, the two results together at any single time point to get uh, the smooth posterior. Okay, so that's what it's called a parallel method. It's also sometimes called the forward backward algorithm as well. <coughs> And similarly, what you would do is you would, um, if you only want to know this posterior distribution, you don't care about normalization terms, again, you, you can renormalize these betas as well at each stage to avoid any under or overflow properties. Okay, so the, the, the second classical thing to do is what's called correction smoothing. So what you do with this one is you say, well, I want to know what this is. What is the posterior distribution, the smooth one, ht could be 1, 2, 3, 2. And I'll just introduce this ht plus 1 into this expression. It's a margin. And then what you do is say, well, OK, I can, um, I can rewrite that as p of ht um, plus 1 given v1 to t. You know, plus h1. So you write that the first one is p of ht plus 1 given v1 to t. Uh, times by, sorry, um, so p of h uh, t given h t plus 1, v1 to t, times by h t plus 1, given v1 to t. Okay, so and then you rewrite this as p h t given h t plus one v one to t v t plus one to big t. H t. So now, um, what you can realize is that so you want to know what is. This is how you want to get it. So you want to know ht, you know ht plus 1, you know v1 to t, and you know vt plus 1 uh, to, to t. So you want to know something about this guy, given that you observed this, this, and this. Okay. And if you observe this, these guys here play no role. It's condition independent of this gain because of this deconnecting and so on. Okay? So that means you can draw up this dependency here. That's cool, because immediately you get a recursion there. So this is the smooth distribution time t. This is the smooth distribution of the future time for t plus one. So if I call this gamma, be this smooth uh, I simply get this equation, gamma ht, which is similar to this expression, times gamma ht plus 1. 
So straight away I get this recursion for this new distribution. Then the question is, how do I get this term here? Well, I just use Bayes' rule to rewrite that um, in this form here. So it's just proportional to the, the transition times by the so, yeah. yeah. so this term here, um, this transition term here, is just given by this expression. It's very simple. So you know how to compute that. It's just a yeah. So this one is, uh, what, what this means is that to get this term here, you need to know the filtered expression. So what that means is that the correction smoothing is a sequential method in the sense of you have to first run your filtering to get your alphas, so you can get and compute these terms here. Then when you're at the end of the chain, you can start going back, correcting your filtered estimates into smooth estimates. So you start off with, the, say, what the, the first smooth estimate is just the filtered estimate, which is the same at the end, at the end of the chain, but the same thing. And then you start working backwards, correcting the previous ones according to this formula, where this expression is given by the transition modulated by your filtered time. Go back. And again, if you, if you want, you can uh, renormalize that. Uh, Stage, although in this case these are actually should be already normalized distributions, so you shouldn't have to renormalize unless there's numerical uh, random problems. Okay, so these are these are very famous uh, algorithms in you know, various uh, parts of the science, of particular engineering. They like you know, all these. Uh, they introduced all these horrible terminologies, smoothing and filtering. And, but uh, the correction smoothing, the sequential smoothing, it's also what's called the, the alpha gamma uh, method and the parallel method. These are the two main methods. Now, so this is all easy stuff, and this, this is another easy thing. But uh, let's imagine you want to do something more complicated, like learning a HMM, learning the parameters of a HMM. Now, what could you do? You could do here. That could be one way to try to learn parameters of HMM. So in other words, if I give you, say, just a sequence of Vs, and I said, you know, I want you to learn now the emission and the transition matrix, A and B. So what you could do is you could write down uh, the EM algorithm for that case. So what does the EM algorithm do? Well, it would look at the it would look at the energy terms, I call it the expected completed log likelihood. So the expect, expected completed log likelihood. That's the term. This is with some function of, of the transition and emission parameters. So this is the EM. Now for the HMM, this splits into the sum over time points of the log of P of V C given HT plus the log of P of HT given HT minus 1. You have to take the expectation of this over Q. HT, this whole thing marginalized that here, and you're just left with the sum over T expected V T given HT, Q HT given V1 to T. And simply for here, I've got the sum over T, an expectation of log P H T given H T minus 1. This is a function of the, the, the two neighboring time points. So you need to know now the distribution HT and HT minus 1 in V1 to T. Okay. 
So that's fine. This term here, this when you're doing EM, this will be the posterior distribution. It's the filtered posterior distribution. Sorry, it's the smooth posterior distribution at your old uh, with the old variables a, your old a and your old b. If you remember how this thing goes, you know you would initialize an a and a b, you'd write them, say, you then compute the filtered posterior distribution. I'm not going to write down the whole expression, but you know you then to maximize this term here with respect to the emission parameters to get your new updates. Right? So that's OK. But with this term here, to get the transition matrix, which will, will be coming in here, you need to know the two time points smooth distribution, which is not something we've discussed yet. So you could say, well, that's easy. You know, I can use a junction tree algorithm. And that will just give it me directly, actually, because the cleats are in the in the end space. They are actually containing two neighboring H's. So you can get it from the junction tree algorithm directly. Or you could say, I can use a factor graph formalism, and I can also get this thing that way. Again, okay, those are two valid ways of getting this two time point marginal. But again, in practice, we don't do that. We do it uh, directly. So um, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but if you read this expression here, this derivation, there is also a direct way to compute the, the two time point marginals, uh, which is just simply related. This is actually the filter distribution, the, the alpha, the beta, just with the kind of the sandwiched in between is the sort of the emission and transition distribution. And actually, this expression is kind of nice because you can see this is what what you get from a factor graph representation. You know, your factor graph would say I'm passing messages up to this point from the past, I pass the message from the end of the chain down to this point. I bracket what I'm interested in here, which is the sort of the the factors which contain the time t. So my posterior distribution from the general factor graph formula so it's going to indeed be proportional to this expression here. Anyway. So the point is that then you know you need you need this two time point marginal to carry out EM for um, for learning parameters of H and M. So my my um, my hope is that one of the assignments, the fourth assignment, will contain a learning a H and M uh, problem. And I'm um, hoping it's going to be a kind of an interesting exercise actually. So you 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 need to get familiar with this uh, stuff, unfortunately, or, unless you use my software directly. Um, yeah. So uh, the, I haven't completely set it up yet, but uh, the hope is that you'll be playing a game, and to play the game well, you'll need to learn H and M. So the player of the game, basically, and you need to try to beat uh, this game. So. So similarly, I'll uh, just briefly go through this. The, the most likely joint state, the gain can be directly inferred. Uh, you know, we don't, people didn't know about these geometry tree algorithms. You can also just write down a simple uh, message passing algorithm directly. OK, so this is the burglar thing you've seen before. Learning HMMs, there's some stuff in here about how to do that. Which I'm not going to bore you with. You can read the details. It's the same stuff as we did before. You just apply to the HMM. And uh, okay, that's the we'll stuff about this stuff. Okay. All right. So that's HMM done. The last thing I want to tell you about um, for the whole course. is sampling. OK, so bear with it. This is the last, last thing, OK? So you know a lot of, you know an awful lot. You know almost as much as me, <laughs> Maybe some people would say, you know, we should have done this right at the start, but uh, what the heck is sampling anyway? So what if I've been using this word uh, throughout the course, perhaps not really explaining what it means, but I'll try to 
give a better picture now. So what I mean is that you've got a distribution P of X, okay? And let's say that this is a univariate thing, for one that, and that, that these things are discrete, the states of X are discrete. Um, so what I mean is that a sample or a set of samples is, say, a collection of states. And these states have the property that if you were to say, let's look at the health uh, sample, and we put a 1 if that's in, in, in the state x. And if we take the, you know, the average number of times that we see the samples in state x, in the limit that we have a large number of samples, that should become equal to the probability of the state x occurring under the distribution. So in other words, if I've got two states, and my set of samples is 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2. I count the number of times I see 1 and divide by the number of times, the number of samples. And that thing, if the sampling is correct, that limit should, as I have more and more samples, should tend to the probability that 1, of, of generating 1 under the distribution P. Yeah. So I tried to write that here. That's what a, that's what sampling is. And in the continuous variable case, it's the same kind of idea, except that we basically we look at a small volume in the, in, in the X space, and we just want the probability of occupancy of that volume to be uh, sort of approaching the integral of the probability density function over that volume, and then we have a large number of samples. So if you've got these samples, what, what can you do with it? Well, you could use it to approximate expectations. So if you've got some function f of x, then you want to copy the average of that with respect to p of x. You could, instead of carrying out this sampling direct, this, this average directly, you could use the samples that you've got. Right? So you could say, well, p of x, um, this expectation, I could sort of say, well, basically I can compute the average over the samples. So I could approximate this expectation by the sum of the value of each of the samples in the normal and so on. Okay, that's one uh, thing you could do. Is it clear why this is true, or why you can do that? I mean, another way, another way to think about it is that effectively you, you could say this is an, an empirical distribution, which essentially has got mass. Um, you know, in each of these observed states, and if I were to replace this p by its empirical distribution, this expectation on the empirical distribution would be equal to this. And I said, if I, if I get more and more samples, the empirical distribution will actually tend to the true distribution anyway. So that's another way to, to view this. So the thing that's, that to bear in mind, though, is that this sample estimate of your expectation is a function, of course, of the samples that you have, right? So if you have another, you know, another set, another set of samples, <coughs> you'll get a different value for this expected, this approximated expectation. It won't be exactly the same. So this, this thing is a function, this approximation is a function of this actual sample set that you have. So, so what we want to do is, you know, we, we can use, if we want to approximate expectations, if we have some method which can draw samples from the distribution P, uh, we can use it to approximate them. Um, so that's nice. So maybe we could do, if there's some thing where, you know, these integrals are difficult to do, these expectations are maybe a high dimensional problem or something like that. If we, if we could draw samples from the distribution, then we could approximate the expectations using these samples. That's one thing we could do. So, the, but the question then is that how to draw samples? How, how do you actually draw samples from a distribution? If you can't compute the expectation, how can you draw samples? That's something we're going to try to uh, discuss later. First of all, I want to think about you know, what what is a sampling. What is a sampling process or procedure? It's something where it spits out a set of samples. If you were to run that sampling procedure again, 
you might spit out another set of samples. So you can think about a sampling procedure as something which is spitting out sets of samples. It's generating sets of samples. In other words, it's generating probability distribution over sets of samples. That's what a sampling, that's what a sampler is doing. Okay, so a sampler is something, let's call it P tilde, which is generating sample sets, script X. You see what I mean? So, so this might be, you know, I could, um, one, two, three, you know, there's whatever, seven uh, samples for, let's just say, script X. So the first, this is my, you know, the first sample set. Uh, maybe I run my sampler again, I might get another set of samples. Won't necessarily be the same. I can keep going, drawing sample sets. And my sampling, so you could then see this is a, a distribution over sets. It's drawing. It's each time it's giving me a realization of uh, sets. So in some sense, you could think about this. A sampler is something, which is um, drawing these sets with some particular probability. That's what a sampling algorithm is doing. Okay. So, if we now think about our sample expectation, so our, our average, our f hat, which depend upon x, an interesting question is, what would happen if I were to you know, run that, I get another set of samples from my sampling algorithm, and I get another expectation and we get another approximation of the expectation. And if I take the average of all of these approximations, the average with respect to this sampling process, what is the average of all of those approximations? Okay, so that's what I'm writing down here. The expectation of the sample average with respect to the sampling process. Well, the, because everything's linear, f hat is just the sum over in one over L, the sum over the samples. So this means that I can bring that inside. I need to know then what is the marginal probability of my sample generating XL. Okay. So if the sampling algorithm generates the marginal XL with the same probability of P of XL, of the real distribution of P, then all of these are equal, they're all equal to um, the average of F of X with respect to P of X, and this sum then just becomes the average of F of X with respect to P of X. So in other words, this is this unbiased property. If the um, so if the, if, the, if the sampling algorithm generates XL according to the correct probability, the actual probability P of XL, right, then your expectation is unbiased. Your, 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 so if you have to keep doing this process many times, averaging all of your approximations, you get the exact answer. Okay, so what we, that's a good property to have. So typically, sampling algorithms are constructed to have this unbiased property. It's something that people desire to have. They want the, if you were to take the average of all of your sample approximations, that this will actually, in the limit of a large number of samples, will actually essentially be, give you the correct answer. That's the unbiased property that people want to get. Okay. So, for this to happen, by the way, I don't require, I don't make any uh, assumptions about whether or not these sampling, the samples here are generated uh, independently or dependently or anything like that. I just need this marginal requirement. Now, what you also want is that 
if you take, say, you know, you get an, an expected expectation for uh, an average expectation from this sample set, you get another expectation for this sample set. So you could write down the values of all of these expectations, right? So you might get some value here and some value here and some value here. These are the values of the, for these approximations, the values of the approximations for each sa sample set that I get. So I could write down the distribution, actually, empirical distribution of this approximations, the expectation. So what I want is that the mean of this thing, if I take the mean of this distribution, actually this is equal to the real expectation. That's the unbiased property. Ideally, though, I'd also like that the variance of this thing is quite small. So that means if I have a small number of samples, any one of them is actually not going to be very far away from the actual mean, which is, should be the, the exact answer. So this is the, the property that you would like, in addition to the, the, the thing to be unbiased, you would like the variance to be small as well. Because then you have more confidence that for a finite number of samples, that uh, you will actually have quite an accurate answer, a small number of uh, sample sets. Uh, so let's write down what is the variance of the sample approximation, okay? The expected variance, the expected uh, deviation for this mean. So the expected deviation of this uh, quantity, the, the, the approximation to the expectation, is the expectation, is expectation is just the you know, parameter value, this is the mean, this is the actual empirical mean, minus the actual thing, right? So this is, f hat of x minus this expectation over the empirical set. Okay, that's this thing here. And I can also write the what is the deviation itself of the function with respect to the true distribution as well. Anyway, I'm interested then is what is the expectation of this deviation with respect to the sampling process? Okay, so I I write down this is the this by definition here. This is the delta f squared. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna rush. I'm rushing through this a little bit, but uh, this term here is um, can be re-expressed as when this L and L prime are the same. I get this term here. There are gonna be L of them when they're the same, and they're gonna be L squared minus L terms when these are different, and L and L prime is different. So let's imagine that we're in a situation where this sampling process is independent in the sense that there is nothing connecting L and L prime. So L, in this term here, L is not equal to L prime, okay? So let's imagine the sampling process says, well, So that means I can take the expectation inside here for L and the expectation inside here for L prime. Because it's unbiased, the expectation of the deviation is zero. So under this, if this were independent, this term would be zero. And then we're left with one over L times by this term here. Okay. So if the sampling process Produces in its independent samples. The variance of this empirical distribution here, this ex empirical estimate approximation, scales like one over L times the real variance of F. So that means that if I get more samples L, the variance of this thing will go down. So this is great, which means that so the variance of my approximation. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I increase the number of samples in the sample set. So that's cool. That gives me a lot of um, confidence that my sampling, my sample approximation is going to be accurate. Okay. 
So th these are the these are the only there are only two key ideas in the sampling, and, and you've just seen both of them. These are critical to understand. Unbiased and have a low variance. Okay. So what we've shown is that provided that the marginal distribution of the sampling process is gives is the correct marginal, we have an unbiased property. And critically, if the marginal if the two if the sampling process produces samples independently, the variance of the approximation will be low. If it's not the case, if these samples are not produced independently, we cannot say this. And it could mean that we have an order one variance for the approximation, which would be a disaster. It would mean that as we keep increasing the number of samples, I have no idea whether or not my approximation is actually improving. It's because the variance could be still huge. You know, it might be just an unlucky. Maybe it's still the variance is all over the place. It could be miles away from the actual mean. So, I just say this one point. So, the thing is, so if you want to do sampling as an approximation procedure, you need to. Ideally, the ideal situation is that the samples are produced independently, and the whole game is to try to do that. The problem is, it's almost impossible. But we're going to next time talk about ways that people have been thinking about how to draw approximately independent samples, which are unbiased. So I was just going to ask, how does it change in the multivariate case? Is there it's the same. There's okay. no this 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 um, description here is independent of the dimension. Oh, okay. um, it just becomes even more difficult in the, in the multivariate case to produce independent samples. Okay. But we'll discuss some classical methods to to to, to do that uh, next time. Okay. Yeah. So remember, next time, do you know, if you've got more questions. Then uh, do you uh, take a